the Mary Clark story is one chapter in the much larger story of slavery and freedom. And in my understanding of American history, that big story of slavery and freedom is at the very center of the history of all of us. So what is the story of Mary Clark? And what did she do that makes her so interesting and compelling to her descendants and of such importance to historians and Indiana history? Mary's Indiana story begins in Vincennes, the oldest town in the state. Mary was brought here as a slave without her family from Kentucky in 1815. She was about 19 years old. How did this happen and why? To answer these questions, it's helpful to understand the historical background of the area, especially Vincennes here on the Wabash. Today, Vincennes looks like many other Indiana cities of its size. But it is different because so much of the state's early history occurred here. French settlers and trappers were living at the current site of Vincennes by 1727, and a fort was constructed in 1732. The French brought their culture with them, including slavery. A 1746 count in the small French settlement of Vincennes found 40 citizens and five slaves. The French created black codes to regulate the behavior of slaves, to control them, to treat them as property, like pigs and cows, movable goods. Beginning in the early 1750s, the French and their allies, several Indian tribes from the region, fought the British for control of a large area that included Vincennes. It's called the French and Indian War. And the French lost. So in 1763, the area officially became part of the British Empire. But, and this is very important to our story, the French were allowed to keep their slaves. Following the American Revolution, the British were mostly gone from this area. But slavery remained here and became an American issue that required some kind of action from the new American government. In 1787, the United States Congress passed the Northwest Ordinance. It set out a form of government for the area north and west of the Ohio River. This included what would become Indiana Territory, including Vincennes. The ordinance stated directly that there shall be neither slavery nor involuntary servitude in the said territory. Then in 1800, the U.S. Congress created the Indiana Territory out of the Northwest Territory. It was a vast area that included what later would become the states of Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin, and part of Minnesota. William Henry Harrison was appointed governor of the Indiana Territory, and he made his home in Vincennes, which was the territorial capital. He moved there in 1801 and built a plantation-style home that he called Grouseland. The Grand House still stands, visited by thousands each year. And with his supporters, he exerted a major influence in Mary Bateman Clark's Vincennes when he was governor. The Northwest Ordinance clearly rejected slavery and involuntary servitude, but this law was ignored and challenged. The Northwest Ordinance of 1787 did not allow slave owners to bring their property across the Ohio River and into Indiana Territory. 
But that same ordinance did not specify the status of slaves already here, already owned by Americans in the territory. And on the streets of Vincennes, you would encounter uh, French slaves and the children of those French slaves that were, in, uh, were tolerated. Governor Harrison was from Virginia. His uh, family back in Virginia had 40 slaves on the old family plantation and saw nothing particularly wrong with slavery. He felt that that was a way to develop the territory. There was lots of land here in Indiana and not enough people to work the land. By the time the Indiana Territory was established, this land in and around Vincennes attracted many people. Most were farmers from the upland south, Tennessee, North Carolina, Virginia, Kentucky. Not surprisingly, these people brought their culture with them, just as the French had. Uh, this is south of the Mason-Dixon line, if you extend it west from the boundary between Pennsylvania and Maryland, and the culture here was primarily South, and uh, there, there was an attitude that slavery was certainly tolerated. It was tolerated, but really not supported by all the new migrants. There was good reason for this. Many of the upland Southerners were poor white farmers that had been squeezed out by these big plantations down in Kentucky and Virginia, and were not too happy to have slavery to compete with. They wanted a free labor market. They, they were not particularly pro-black by any means, but they, they didn't want slavery. Many Hoosiers were opposed to slavery, but that did not mean that they were in favor of equality for African Americans. These might appear to be contradictory notions, but they actually made good sense to Hoosiers in the early 19th century. Opposed to slavery, not in favor of equality for blacks. Of course, Indiana would have been a place where both a lot of people came from the South, but there were, there were other paths of uh, immigration uh, that wouldn't have uh, produced people who were below the Mason-Dixon line, so to speak, and would have, would have had a very different and very strong abolitionist view about slavery. Governor Harrison and his supporters actually tried to overturn the anti-slavery provision of the Northwest Ordinance. They tried it through legal means three times, and three times they failed and then they resorted to subterfuge, to getting around the law. In 1805, Harrison and his associates pushed through the legislature a new law that permitted slavery by another name, indentured servitude. A person could buy a slave down in Kentucky or Tennessee or whatever, bring him here to Indiana, tell him, you are now free, but in gratitude for my having freed you, you will sign this indenture where you will agree to work for me for a certain fixed period of time, at the end of which you will be free. And if they refused, you had the right to sell them back down into slavery down south. Uh, so it was not freely arrived at, it was not a free will agreement, but uh, this, this law was uh, observed here in the Indiana Territory. So, in this way, Governor Harrison and his successor, Governor Thomas Posey, and their supporters subverted the federal prohibition of slavery in the Northwest Ordinance. One of the problems for Harrison and for Governor Posey was that the population was changing in ways that adversely affected them. The numbers of newcomers who opposed slavery grew. Those who favored slavery declined proportionately in part because many slave owners realized that moving to Indiana was risky. And so because of these population shifts, by 1810, it was possible to repeal the 1805 law. Not because so many Hoosiers were opposed to slavery, but because they were as free laborers opposed to competing with slave labor. They did not want slavery in Indiana for good economic reasons, not so much moral reasons. But in reality, things did not change all that much. Indentures made before 1810 remained legal. Masters of newly arriving African Americans into the territory continued to bind them to service in ways that approached slavery. They were bought, sold, bequeathed in wills, and subject to public whippings. And so while the 1810 repeal did not remove the grim realities of slavery and of indentured servitude, 
it did set a new direction that would lead to change in Corydon in 1816 and 1820. So this was the environment that Mary Bateman faced when she was brought to Indiana. She was born in Kentucky in 1795. In 1814, she had been purchased in Kentucky as a slave for life by Benjamin J. Harrison. But it was illegal to bring new slaves into Indiana Territory. So slaveholders who brought the slaves here had to free them on paper and then turn around and indenture them. So this document shows that. Mary was offered a deal she could hardly refuse, an indenture. It said that she would be Harrison's indentured servant for 30 years. And the law provided that you could have this person on approval. You would have 60 days to persuade this person to do this. And if they refused, you had the right to sell them back down into slavery down south. So, Mary had no choice but to sign the indenture agreement. Of course, she couldn't sign, so she made her mark. What must Mary have been going through? 19 years old, just off the farm, no family or friends, in a strange place against her will, illiterate, with no idea what was happening to her. What must she have been feeling and thinking? If there was any doubt that Mary's involuntary servitude agreement was another form of slavery, the events of October 24th, 1816 made it clear. Benjamin J. Harrison sells the, the agreement to General Washington Johnson for 300 something dollars. And uh, he immediately then has her sign in a new indenture where she agrees to work for 20 years. They use that long word indenture, you know, means taking you out of slavery just to put you back in again. And if I had not put my ex on that paper, indenturing myself to that General Washington Johnston, they could have scooped me up, carried me back down south, <laughs> and put me back in slavery. By then she had married Samuel Clark. She had children. Uh, she would do anything to stay with her children and her husband. So it wasn't just about her at this point. She, she had to think about a lot of more people. Sometime in the fire Sometime in the fire there's no doubt that the religious faith of Mary and Sam helped them deal with the threats and injustices of their situation and maintain their pride and dignity. There was another real, real important find in who she is and, and what she did and what she had accomplished that came through an AME church history. And lo and behold, as Mary Clark would say, <laughs> lo and behold, there in, in the very first chapter of the biographies was one on Mary Clark and her husband, Sam. It told the history of Mary Clark coming from Kentucky into Vincennes. It was actually very accurate in terms of the dates, as I would later find out as I found the indentured paperwork through the court case and um, newspaper articles and other secondary kinds of sources of information. In 1816, when Indiana is about to become a state, Mary and many others are still bought and sold like animals. The Northwest Ordinance was impossible to enforce. The authority that would do so was a long way off in Washington, D.C., leaving the governor, the legislature, the people of Indiana with the responsibility of doing what they wanted to do. And if they didn't want to follow the Northwest Ordinance, there was no one that was going to make them. But that was soon to change. In 